Imagine an AI where all in the same model, you could translate languages, write code, solve crossword puzzles, be a chatbot, and do a whole bunch of other crazy things. This sort of an AI would certainly require a supercomputer of hundreds of A100 GPUs and months of training, even on all that power. We would need a team of researchers, the best of the best. We're talking about a project in the realm of, say, five plus million dollars. So when you're done, you probably want to keep it to yourself. Maybe you'll sell access via an API, but definitely you can't share the actual model because of AI safety or something like that. What if I told you, though, for the last year, a group of over a thousand researchers has been quietly working on their own version of a 176 billion parameter model trained on the nuclear-powered supercomputer, the Jean Zay, and is available now for you to download free of charge. You can download multiple size variants all the way up to 176 billion parameters for free. I'm talking about the Bloom model. Bloom is an acronym that stands for Big Science, Large, Open Science, Open Access, Multilingual. But for all intents and purposes, it's more like big language out of memory. <laughs> so just how much memory are we talking here? Well, it's going to cost you about 680 gigabyte-ish of memory. You can also run at half precision and use more like 350 gigabytes of memory with likely minimal performance difference in terms of the output quality. But either way, a lot of memory. <laughs> So I know there are probably like a couple of you guys out there who don't have a Puget workstation with a terabyte of RAM. So what can you do? Well, it turns out that Hugging Face has your back. Not only have they facilitated to a large extent this model's very training and existence, as well as making the model available for you to download for free, they're also hosting the inference of this model via their API at the very fair price of free. This API is also GPU hosted. It's on A100s. So your inference times should be 50 to 100 times faster than what you'd be seeing inferencing this model locally with RAM anyways. There is a queue, however. So if you do have your local A100 compute cluster available, you could use that instead. Besides all of these options, you don't actually have to run the full 176 billion parameter model. Bloom has many sizes from a mere 350 million parameters to one bill, two bill, and six billion. For many tasks, you'll probably find that these smaller models are sufficient. All of the examples mentioned in the intro are real, actual, non-cherry picked outputs from the Bloom model which is what we would call a large language model or an LLM. This style model, while not entirely new, is fairly novel and very unique in how we as deep learning and just programming engineers might interact with it. GPT-3 is another large language model with a very similar size, 175 billion parameters, which came out about two years ago. We're still learning new things that GPT-3 and large language models in general can do, but we've learned quite a bit. It's also just been the case that these really massive models have only been available and accessible to a pretty small subset of developers, and developers already make up a tiny subset of people in general who might come, come up with like unique ways to leverage technology like this. Your typical free-range human has absolutely no idea that models like this exist, nor how they really work at all or could be used. But even deep learning engineers struggle with this new sort of paradigm of prompt engineering. And part of what makes this hard is many of the tasks that someone might try to get this model to do, and that it can do, are not what this model actually is doing. So, for example, you could use this model for a regression type task and generate a scalar sentiment score for text. But large language models aren't regressors, at least not this one. You could use this model to be a chatbot. But these models are not sequence to sequence models that generate a response to some input. In very simplistic words, large language models just generate continued text based on the input text. They're predicting basically what words will come next based on the words that they've seen so far. 
Based on this capability, we can what's called prompt the model to generate outputs that actually are doing the task that we want them to do. But again, this is all just the model attempting to continue a string of text based on probabilities of what it thinks should come next. And this distinct difference in how we interact with these models and get them to do what we actually want to do is what makes prompt engineering kind of its own field entirely. In fact, I kind of think, especially if things keep going the way that they're going, you will have an entire subsection and field of people who aren't even programmers who are prompt engineers, and that's their job. But what this means is if you want Bloom or a large language model to behave like a chatbot, your prompt needs to contain structure that suggests it's something like a chat dialogue. So maybe you have something like a speaker name, colon, some text, a new line, and then another speaker, a colon, and then nothing. This will almost certainly elicit a continuation from the large language model that mimics chatbot text. But the large language model, it's not a chatbot. It's just generating a continuation of the text that you put in, which also means it can, in general, generate more than just one speaker's response. You can almost expect that it will. This means you'll often see in an example like this that it might actually just generate quite a bit more of that conversation rather than just a simple response. If you wanted to make an actual chatbot application from here, you'd wind up coding some logic to stop at a new line or the next speaker and so on. So how does the model actually know what's next? Basically, it's seen all of the text. Bloom specifically has been trained on a total of 1.6 terabytes of text data, which contains 46 natural languages and 13 programming languages, the distribution of which you can see here. And for programming languages specifically, here's their distribution. We can peruse this data set by visiting one of the Hugging Face spaces that illustrates the corpus in a sort of map and interactive form. You can click through and then find any specific data set on the corpus page. From here, you can usually click through and see what that corpus contains and even kind of see some of the text examples. In this case, we have topics ranging from medicine, chemistry, engineering, psychology, economics, to art, history, philosophy, and more. And this is just one of the data sets in one of the categories under one of the languages of the entire data set that this blue model was trained on. Like I said, basically all the text. But it's a good idea to have an understanding of this text to some extent so you understand because your prompts should look something like some of the text that the model has seen or a combination of them. So for example, within the code category, we have both GitHub as well as Stack Exchange. And this can influence how we might interact with this model. If the model thinks we're producing a uh, text that looks more like Stack Overflow versus maybe GitHub. So on GitHub, the text that you might find is generally gonna be finished, working, acceptable code, <laughs> and it will be mostly code. On Stack Exchange, often the first snippet of code is actually, it has some sort of flaw or issue with it. And there can be as much as 50% or more is actually natural language text, not actual code. This can either bite us in the foot or we can use this to our advantage when we're prompting to get the type of output that we're actually wanting. All of these large language models also have parameters that can be tweaked. Things like how long of a generation do you want to make? Temperature, which is a degree of creativity and diversity in token choice. There's also top P, another parameter to influence the pool of possible tokens to consider, and so on. You might be wondering, what are tokens? Essentially, tokens are what you get when you convert some string of text to an array of values. This blue model uses a byte level byte pair encoder for tokenization. What this means essentially is every possible character is covered, but the total vocabulary size is 250,680, which is way more tokens than you would need for full vocab coverage of a just character level model. So not only do we have character only, but we also have many combinations, including words, words plus punctuation, and so on. So all of that is included here. The benefit here is no matter what, you'll never see what was once the dreaded unk or unknown token. 
you will always get valid tokens because the actual vocab that the model has, there's no, no word that you could produce that is not covered already. So what this means is you can do things like make up new words to feed to the model and the model can actually not only understand those new words, that model can plausibly create new words to return back to you. So when we see the word token, just think of this as a numerical ID that is assigned to a bit of text. And these are numbers that the machine learns to represent as that bit of text. To further solidify this, let's peek at this just very briefly. So with the example text, the Bloom model is very interesting. We can see how this is tokenized by passing this to the tokenizer for the Bloom model. Here we can see that we get returned a vector of input IDs. Sometimes these IDs are just a word. Sometimes they're some of the letters of the word, and sometimes they're a combination of words, spaces, and other grammatical elements. For example, notice ID 34,495. This word is interesting with a leading space. This means the interesting in this case is probably not the beginning of a quote, probably not the beginning of a sentence, etc. We can even take this a step further and just tokenize the lowercase word interesting. We can see here that actually this tokenizes into two tokens, one being inter and the other being esting. We can also try tokenizing some random sequence of characters. In this case, we find that the first ID, 208032, is the lowercase s with an asterisk, and then we can see ID 42 is a capital G. Here's the tokenization and their representations for the Bloom acronym. So these IDs and tokens, these are what models like Bloom are generating and what they're fed. And all they really do is just predict the next best token, given some input sequence. If we know we want Bloom to finish a sentence, for example, we might just ask for only 10 or 20 more tokens and then trim the end if there's extra. If we want an entire paragraph, then maybe we ask more like for 500 tokens. So to begin, let's imagine we want Bloom to show us how to do some coding in OpenCV in Python. We might try a prompt like use OpenCV in Python, but the output of that is just a continuation of natural language. It looks kind of like maybe it came from Stack Overflow. It sounds like someone who is just outlining their goals and dreams of using OpenCV, but that's not what we wanted. We can sympathize with that, but we want the code. As programmers, and probably as many of you have done with GitHub Copilot, you probably know what needs to be done. We need to add a hashtag or a pound sign and a space to the beginning of this text. In this case, we can see that Bloom produces code and well-commented code at that, that illustrates to us some of the basics of using OpenCV, at least to start. Now, why did this work? We wanted Bloom to generate some code for us, but to do that, we needed to structure the prompt to be like some of the code Bloom has seen, rather than like the text Bloom has seen where people are simply talking about code or maybe about modules that might be used with that code. So Bloom doesn't code, but Bloom can continue to generate text that looks like code that it's seen before, and it's seen a lot of code. Bloom also isn't a chatbot, so treating Bloom immediately like it's a chatbot and issuing a prompt like, what should I do today, merely produces text that continues this, and it really appears more like the original speaker is just continuing their speech. But that's not what we wanted, we wanted a reply. So to make Bloom behave more like a chatbot, what we need to do is rethink that prompt. What we need to do is prompt Bloom with text that's structured like a chat transcript. Something like person, colon, what should I do today? New line, bot, colon, then nothing. This will very strongly encourage Bloom to produce a continuation of essentially a transcript, and it does. So again, this isn't a chatbot. Instead, it's more like a transcript generator. But if you wanted to, you could make it a chatbot. All you would need to do is just add some logic on top. So for example, you might just go until the next new line character, or maybe you use a regular expression to identify a name, colon, space, you know, identification for the next speaker. So again, so far we've seen that this is just a generative model, but through prompt engineering, we can influence this model to do and produce things in a desired way. And then we've also seen how we can incorrectly attempt to prompt it and how we can go about trying to fix that. It turns out that we can actually influence the output even more. Let's continue with this chatbot idea. So what if we wanted to give the chatbot a bit of character? So we might try a prompt like this, where we prime it a bit by suggesting this is an argumentative chatbot. 
and then we'll call it ArguBot. <laughs> Upon us asking how ArguBot is doing, we see ArguBot responds with, I'm fine, thank you, how are you? This is absolutely unacceptable. In this case, it appears the zero shot example isn't going to work, and we might need to prime it a bit with an example reply. In this case, we include a sassy reply example in the prompt before feeding in the real question about hobbies and prompting the ArguBot to reply. In this case, when we ask if ArguBot has any hobbies, it's at least a negative reply, but I'd like something better than this. Maybe argumentative and argue aren't the right words. We could try mean, for example. And this seems to be the same as ArguBot. Let's try RudeBot. <laughs> I like this response a whole lot more. This is more in line with what I was going for. And let's see if we can keep it going. <laughs> and now, now I like it even more. And the reason why this worked, again, is these models continue generating new tokens based on probabilities. Sometimes all you need to do is maybe change a word to another synonym of that word, and now you've opened up a new new set of probabilities. So all of this so far is, is really cool, and I would like to dive more deeply into the chatbot aspect of things specifically, as well as other attributes and capabilities of this model much more specifically. And that's probably its own entire video on the side or multiple videos. So maybe more on that later. Comment below if you want to see more of that or some specific example, you know, with me diving a little deeper. But instead, let's focus on some other interesting examples of what these generative models can do. Because so far we've seen it code, we've seen it be a chatbot, but these models can actually do quite a bit more advanced things. So, so far we've just seen things in a very linear fashion as, as far as how it's generating its output, but let's see something else. So, imagine you're balling out of control. You're dismantling historical bridges to move your mega yacht through, and you're launching into space for tourism. But on the side, you also run the largest online marketplace, and you want to do analytics on user reviews of products on your website. So, I've grabbed here a random review from a product on your website, and what I want to do is boil this review down to the meaningful things, because this person talked way too much. I don't have time for this. So maybe what we want to do is categorize it or figure out what is it a review of. We probably want to know if it's a good or bad review, and then maybe we want to briefly summarize it. Time is money. So you might think you need to do that like one at a time, one prompt at a time but you can actually prompt multiple responses from a large language model like Bloom, and it can be done fairly non-linearly. So for example, you can form the prompt to contain a review, a numbered list of questions about that review, and then start the answers with the one. So you're prompting Bloom to go up to that number one question, answer it, and then what would be the most likely next thing that you would generate? Well, it's gonna be an answer to the second question. And running this, we can see that Bloom understands this is a review of a recliner. The review is overall positive, and it can even pull out the meaningful aspects of the review and shorten it considerably. And it did all that in one fell swoop, essentially performing three tasks for us. And so not only did it know how to answer those questions, it also knew how to continue that kind of structure of our prompt where it was like this kind of questionnaire almost structure. And again, this model is not trained to do this. I'm sure there are some samples like this in, in the entire data set, but this is by no means even, you know, mostly what this model was trained to do. All it does is predict the next N tokens. It's through prompt engineering that we can elicit such powerful behaviors. And this is thanks to the large language models, just massive and general understanding of language. And that's not just the English language. Like, like I showed before, this is all language, just language. It's just a large language model. <laughs> Another example of this sort of behavior could be something like code error diagnosis and proposed solutions. So for example, let's take an error that most of you will be seeing if you attempt to run Bloom. <laughs> we can then prompt Bloom like we did before to answer two questions. What causes this error? What does it mean? And how might we fix this? <laughs> the output is accurate and we could probably engineer this prompt even further to be more specific and maybe make multiple suggestions for what might work and how to fix it. But one thing I really want to stress is all of the examples, except for the chatbot example, but I showed you how I worked through that. None of these are cherry-picked examples. These are all examples that I did on my first attempt, and like 
not going to lie, the review one really just blew my mind. <laughs> like, I, I just, sometimes you, you do stuff with AI and, like, you see the result and you just got to get up and walk away from the computer. Like, it's just so mind-blowing. And that is, that's what I just had to walk away when I saw the review, the review one. And again, these aren't cherry-picked. Like, d this model is just insanely powerful. So, how about something a bit more abstract? What if we not only want to have a conversation, like a chatbot, but we want one person speaking one language and another speaking another language. Here we have person one speaking English and person two replying and speaking Spanish. Despite the two different languages, when translated, at least for me, the conversation makes total sense and is correct as far as I can tell. This is a pretty abstract task that requires some understanding of both conversation and a, gen a sort of like global language understanding, which is really interesting to see it, you know, actually doing it so well. I might be wrong, but I really doubt something like this exists in the data set. And if it did, it would be unbelievably rare and it couldn't possibly have influenced the model to, you know, have some sort of, you know, talk in two different languages aspect of some neurons saved in the, saved in the back pocket. Like that's just, it can't be, right? It's just, it's just incredible. Okay, so we've seen a lot of examples of what large language models can do, but it's my best guess that we've only just begun to scratch the surface, especially with layering large language models with a bit of logic, doing these, some more of these like nonlinear tasks, or even multiple large language model tasks on top of each other, or combining large language models and other models. So there have even been examples of attaching a frozen large language model to an image generation model, and then doing things like text to image with pretty good results. I think we'll wind up seeing way more possibilities as more people who aren't even necessarily programmers getting their hands on models like this. It's no surprise that one of the first real tools in the wild powered by large language models is a code assistant, GitHub Copilot. Don't get me wrong, it's an amazing application. I love it. It has made my life way better. But we as programmers are really biased when it comes to trying to think of ways to use technology like this. It was always the first thing I tried when dealing with smaller transformers and even before transformers, some of these earlier sequence to sequence models, you can find the videos on my channel. That was always the thing. I was always like, oh, let's, tr let's get it to do this thing. And I knew I wasn't alone. It was just the thing I wanted in my life. It was the obvious thing. It was the first thing I could think of. And just imagine what happens when doctors, lawyers, copy editors, authors, etc. all the careers get their hands and get their hands on this kind of technology and start thinking of ways that it could help them and make their life better. In this way, I acknowledge, you have to acknowledge OpenAI for leading the way in the R&D of models like this and taking those first steps and leaps in developing large language models. And then other companies like Eleuther AI who have historically contributed the largest truly open source language models and now Hugging Face and the entire big science team just pulling a project like this off along, of course, with the French government supplying their Jean Zay supercomputer through grants and just everyone else involved here. This was a massive project. And just like what an incredible time, you know, to, to be alive where anyone, like anyone, first of all, can access that free API and just tinker around with this incredible large language model. And not only that, you can just, you could just download it. You can just download a $5 million AI. It's just incredible. So I encourage you, if you can run it or you have a way to run it, go ahead and download it, play with it locally. It's so cool with the full context. And if not, you can use that free API. And then also, if not, there's lots of options in the cloud. I wouldn't be surprised if before long, if not already, when I'm recording this, somebody also has it running live in the cloud somewhere. So that's the brilliant thing of somebody really just re training and releasing this model. Anybody can share it and continue to share it and play with it and learn with it. And I can't wait to see the cool things that will come out from models like this just being free and open like this. I mean, it's just, it really is incredible. And I, I, I don't know of many fields where things like this are really truly happening, where that technology that someone has poured all this time, energy, and money into is then just 
released. So very exciting times. Thank you to everyone involved in releasing this model. Um, I'm having a blast playing with it. If you've ever wondered and wanted to know more about how neural networks actually work, including the optimization and fitment, rather than just simply calling some method, then you might be interested in checking out the Neural Networks From Scratch book by myself and Daniel Kukewa. The book can be had in the form of an ebook PDF, softcover, or hardcover, and we ship for free worldwide. Also, the physical books just come with an ebook copy. All copies are in full color, which helps because there's a lot of code syntax highlighting and lots of charts and diagrams to help convey the principles. Also, almost all of those charts and diagrams have QR codes and links that take you to animations to help further illustrate the concepts. This is truly a real neural networks from scratch, teaching everything from the forward pass, calculation of loss, backpropagation, and optimization. The only math that you're expected to know coming in is basic algebra. The rest is taught by us in the book, step by step. Everything is shown and explained in the book first logically, then mathematically, then via raw Python code, no third-party libraries, and then finally optimized via NumPy. And this is for every step of the way, building and training actual neural networks for a fully fundamental understanding of neural networks and how they work from scratch. If at any point you're lost or confused, all copies of the book also grant access to a Google Docs version of the book where you can ask your questions in line with the actual text itself. This is an incredible project that I'm extremely proud of to share with you all. We've sold over 13,000 copies to students all over the world. If you're looking to take your knowledge of deep learning to the next level, or if you're just looking to start that journey, I can't imagine a better way. So to learn more and buy yourself a copy, you can head to nnfs.io.